You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family, today's guest is Chris Larson, founder and principal of Next Level Income. He's been investing and managing real estate and other business ventures for over 20 years, bought his first real estate property when he was 21 years old. He's very passionate, as you'll see in this episode, about helping people and investors become financially independent and also educating the next generation in doing so as well. So we'll welcome Chris to the show here. So happy to have him on and stay tuned. There's a lot of free stuff at the end for those who listen. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about car washes as cash flowing assets. So without further ado, let's get into the show. But as a reminder, if you get any value out of the show, folks, please give us that five-star review and thoughtful comment. It is the best way for us to increase the reach of the Real Estate Runway podcast. Also, you can follow us and our parent company, Quattro Capital, at Team Quattro Capital, one word, no special characters, or by simply visiting us at thequattroway.com. And we love all of you. Please, if you want to reach out, give us some feedback, say hello, or just request a topic. Happy to do that too. Reach out to us at podcast at thequattroway.com. And also, if you want to apply to be on the show, please visit us at thequattroway.com slash podcasts. And now, on to your scheduled production. All right, all right, all right. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton, and we are joined today with the one, the only Chris Larson out of Asheville, North Carolina, founder and principal of Next Level Income. Chris, welcome to the show. How are you today? Chad, I'm great. And look, man, I don't know if if I'm the one and only. There's another Chris Larson out there that founded Ripple, and I was actually on a podcast and I got the email and I'm like, that's not my picture. I'm like, they're like, that's Chris Larson. I'm like, yeah, but that dude's a billionaire. I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. So <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I don't, he's not in Asheville, North Carolina, though. He's definitely not in Asheville, North Carolina. So fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So if you didn't know it, the crypto billionaire, Chris Larson, is not me. So somebody asked me that too on, a, on an investor call. They're like, is this you? I was like, do you really think I'd be talking to you right now if that was me? <laughs> it's like, I, I probably would have written a lot bigger check to get Chris on this podcast if that was that Chris Larson. So <laughs> we'll put it that If way. I get to that point, Chad, you will not have to write a check for me to come on the podcast. I promise. See, that, that's I a promise mindset that. warrior right there. That That is a give first mentality. I love that. Well, Chris, you know, before we get into the show and talk a little bit about you know the meat we're going to get into today, man, yeah. tell us about Chris. Tell us about your journey. It's an amazing story. I'd love to hear just, you know, what made you into the investor you are today and just, you know, a little bit of insight there. Well, I missed the crypto bandwagon. The other Chris Larson grabbed that, so we already know that part. But no, in all seriousness, I decided very early on that I wanted to be an investor. I talked about this in my book and how I, I was racing bicycles. I started racing when I was 14 years old, and yeah, that's about 30 years ago. And that was really my, that was my first, that was my true passion in life. And along the way, I learned a few things racing bikes. One, I learned that you don't make a lot of money being a professional cyclist, even if you're really, really good. You don't make a ton of money. I actually got to train with Lance. I'm sure a lot of people's minds wow. go there before he won the tour and all that stuff happened. You know, but I was also exposed to kind of some of the, you know, kind of the dark side of cycling. And the, the fact of the matter is there's what we saw in cycling. We, we also see that in business and a lot of other things. People cheat in academics. We've seen that in the cheating scandals and different things. And I ended up quitting cycling, quitting racing about a year after my best friend passing away. So all this stuff was happening in cycling. My best friend passed away. I raced another year. And then I decided that there was more to life to that. And I also realized that you needed money if you really wanted to live your best life. And I made a pact that I was going to live with no regrets after my friend died. So I was like, hey, I'm going to go out. I'm going to you know, take advantage of all the opportunities the world has to offer. But I also realized, hey, you have to have money. So... I started reading books, started to educate myself. I was in an engineering program at Virginia Tech, read about 250 books over the next few years and decided ultimately on real estate investing. And long story short, you know, now we're here, you know, having this conversation today, Chad. You know, that's super powerful. And there's there's nothing like an eye-opening moment to realize that, you know, the time we have on this earth is precious, living with no regrets. And, and, I, and I love the thing yeah. you said right there was, 
you know, it's not about making money. It's about having money so you can live with no regrets, right? Not, not be challenged with it. That's, and I think, yeah, I think, you know, sometimes we get those backwards. I was just talking to a good friend of mine about this just a couple hours ago. He's going through some big, big life changes and his wife's going through some health issues. And we were, we were yeah. talking about that. And, you know, I love the expression, Dan Sullivan, founder of Strategic Coach says, if you can write a check for it, it's not a problem. And mm -hmm. that's really, to me, what money is. It's a potential for creating solutions. You know, those solutions may be better opportunities, you know, for, for travel. It may be better opportunities for my family, right? It may be better opportunities to give back to the world, maybe better opportunities to, to create things in life, you know, whether they're experiences or time that we have. And that's really, that's how I view it. You know, you don't know it, but you just stepped into like the the ten thousandth use of Dan Sullivan on this podcast. We love him here. Who not how? Fantastic book. Read it if you haven't. The guy owes me some I. commissions. He's got to. I've sold so many of that books on this podcast. <laughs> but no, you're right. I won't and, bring and it I, up then. And, and I think you know, thinking about, I have a lot of uh, international friends. Right, I used to be in international business. I spent a lot of time in Asia, Europe, Scandinavia. I've seen the world. You know, it's great. And the one thing I learned is is a lot of people from other countries don't understand the American mindset. They look at us and like, you live to work. You did not work to live, you know? And so that translates to people, yeah. you know, like you and me saying, well, we get criticized of, oh, well, you're just working for money. Like, you know, why don't you live a little bit? No, 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 no. It's backwards. You work for money so you can live. You don't, you don't live to work for money, <laughs> you know? But yeah. anyway, I, lo I love yeah. the point you just made there. And by the way, at the end of the podcast, Stay tuned because he mentioned his book. We're going to give you a link to that here at the end of the podcast, as well as talk about, yes, Next Level Income right there, as well as talk about the podcast that Chris hosts as well. If you want to drop that name right here real quick, we'll talk about it again at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have our podcast, Next Level Income Show, and we talk about a lot of the things that you talk about, Chad, trying to help people on their journey towards financial independence. It's really what it's all about. And you know, folks, people get tired of listening to us or maybe they don't, but it's like, once you learn this stuff, you can't unlearn it. You just want to scream it from the mountaintops from all the years you spent not knowing it, you know? So. Well, and I love that you said that because it's, we're, sometimes we're in an echo chamber. So if you're listening to this show, you're probably very fortunate in that you, you've learned things that have helped you get to where you are as, as I have. And I look back and, you know, some of those things is like, right, Chad, we've learned over the last five years, 10 years, 20 right. years. To us, it sounds common, but you know, when I was managing sales teams, you know, there's, I, I was like, oh, I shouldn't be saying this again. But there was one thing that I learned in my leadership training and sales training. Typically, people have to hear things seven times before it becomes common knowledge. So, you know, it's it's sometimes it's good, and you know, even we have to hear it again. You know, even if we've heard it multiple times, to really really believe it deep down. And that's one of the problems with the world today is we've heard all these things from traditional financial planners, right? Like, oh, these are alternative assets. Why is real estate an alternative asset? Like, trust me, real estate's been around longer than the stock market. Life insurance has been around longer than the stock market, right? Like, businesses have been around. but why? And these are alternatives somehow, but it's because we've heard it so much. So sometimes we have to unlearn a little bit, you know, what we've heard so many times from others that are, you know, going down a slightly different path than you are. Yeah. And that's the thing we all have to remember. And then I promise I'll get off the soapbox, you know, but you have to think that the prettier and brighter and, and more places you see a message, it's likely because it has the most marketing dollars behind it. Right. And so that is, that's, that's purely what a lot of people only will ever know is what they see on TV from these financial institutions. And they'll listen to advisors who call things like the oldest asset available. I really do think real estate is probably the oldest form of investment, you know, going back to even predating, you know, slave trade and things like that way back in the day, you know? So it's like, it is, you, know, you have a point there, but, but the idea is, you know, be wary of people who are driving you to things they want you to invest in so they can profit off of them. Do what's right for you. You know, it's a very interesting world out there. It is. And I think if we talk about, I was having this conversation actually with my mother-in-law who's from Canada. She was in town for the holidays here and we were, we were talking and when America was founded, a big reason how America was founded was because private property, right? It's like we're untaxed or we're taxed unfairly, private property, but life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness was originally life, liberty and the pursuit of private property. Mm. And if you think of how fundamental property is, real estate is to the evolution of this country, to the success of this country, 
and just success in general, it really is important. And that doesn't make you, if you're listening, greedy if you want to own property, but you know, it goes even back to the first Thanksgiving. And I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you a little, this is a really funny story in my opinion. And some people might not like this, by the way. So you're listening, some of you may be offended. And if you think you may be offended, you already know who you are. So you can kind of- It's you know, okay, bite, Chris. People who think a, they may be offended, yeah, I've already weeded, I already weeded them out a long good. time ago. So I was going to say, you can bite on a, <laughs> yeah, bite on a, a, a stick or something too, uh, as you get upset. But I, I used to live in this little community and I live in Asheville, North Carolina. My wife and I moved here. And it was, it had a common area and part of the common area when it was deeded to the homeowners association, what we did was we formed you know, this, this green area and the community decided to make it a garden. So these houses, you know, lots of Priuses had solar panels. We actually had a Prius at the time, solar panels on the roof. So, you know, kids were like roaming around free in the neighborhood. It was a great little community we lived in, not a lot of houses, yeah. but we had this community garden. So the community garden gets started. Well, I had my own garden that I already put. And I come from gardeners. I have dairy farmers and also vegetable farmers. One, you know, my father's side of the family were dairy farmers. My mother's side were vegetable farmers. And I was invited and the family was invited to come work in the community garden. And I, I said, no, I'm good. They said, yeah, 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 but you don't understand. We're all going to work in the garden. We're all going to get like vegetables and all this stuff in the garden. I said, that's great. That's great. But I have my own garden. I was on call a lot. I used it kind of like therapy. I was like, I'm good. So the first Saturday, everybody gets together and they go out in the garden and they're working and everybody's happy. And I'm sitting there on, on my deck and I was like, I'm like probably having a beer or something like that. I'm having a good time too, right? I already have my garden. And then the next Saturday, the, the work Saturday comes around and not as many people are out there, but there's still a lot of people having a good time. Several months, a few months go by. And there was like a community picnic, which was cool. And people brought all their stuff in the garden. And then, I don't know, about nine months go by, Chad. Well, now the garden's overgrown. Like one or two people are going out and tending to it. You know, the wild animals are going in there. There was like a compost heap in there. Now wild animals are getting into that. And it was kind of turned into a bit of an eyesore, right? So after a full year, the community garden is, is kind of in disrepair, but there's still some stuff in there and there's some people that are using it. And one of my neighbors would go walk over and he did some work in the garden. He'd go take what he wanted. He'd come back. Well, I kind of had to chuckle to myself that, you know, this, this little mini experiment in socialism really didn't work out that well because, you know, everybody thought, hey, we're going to do this, but people stopped showing up. But the people that were taking food kept showing up at the end. But even worse, my neighbor that would always show up to take the food was stopping at my garden and taking food out of my garden too. Oh, and my. my neighbor told me, because I was looking one day, I'm like, where did my tomatoes go? My neighbor calls me over. He goes, hey, so-and-so next door, he's been stopping and taking tomatoes out of your garden on his way to the community garden. So I just thought it was interesting that you know we had this little mini experiment in our community between you know socialism and private property, and it didn't work out that great. But most of those people still vote for socialism, which is interesting. They didn't quite figure that out in my mind. But I just think whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, down the middle, whatever it is, I think we need to realize how important private property and the ability to create our own wealth and destiny in this country truly is. So sorry, I was on my soapbox, but I think that's just such an important lesson to share. Can you can you pick up that mic real quick and just drop it on the table for me? Is that doable? Is it, you know, it's, it's a good moment right there. But you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. You're right in every aspect, and it was probably an unintentional social experiment. But I mean, what's the one thing missing there, folks? When you take away the pursuit of happiness, or as it used to be written, as we learned earlier, the pursuit of personal property or the option to do that, what happens? You stop trying. You know, and that's and accountability. You know, it's it's like if somebody may be there. Or, you know, there's that resentment, right? It's like anybody that's been on a team, there's somebody that may not pull all their weight. And, and maybe it's been me sometimes, like you feel guilty, right? So it's a balance. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't help our neighbors and those sorts of things. But to me, that was an interesting little experiment there that we got to see the results of. Yeah. I love the tangent we just went down, Chris. This is fun. So, okay. So that was not on, that was not on the, the pre-show planning, Chad. That was not This was on the totally planning. off script. Yeah. That's why I love podcasts. Yeah. You know, this was a good conversation. So, well, let's, let's go back to the script for a minute though, because I do, I am keenly interested in something yeah. that you're investing in right now, you know, and, and you're, you're about the second operator that I've heard doing this and I've never actually spoken about it, but 
you know, in addition to the assets you've been investing in, you know, real estate wise lately, you're starting to get more into cash flowing businesses and car washes. So let's let's walk yeah. that road a little bit. Why the shift? What do you typically invest yeah. in? And let's just go that road a little bit. Great. I, I love how you phrase that. Like why the shift? And um, I, I used to get a, a big question when I left the medical device industry. People would say, Chris, when did you get started in real estate? And as I mentioned here a few minutes ago, I was an investor. I was a real estate investor before I had a career. So I started that when I was 21 before I had like a real career. I didn't start my quote unquote career until I was about 25 and I got- Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did yep. you buy a beer first or a, or a piece of real estate first? You got to know. Ooh, well, I let's see here. I turned 21 about six months before I bought my first piece of real estate. So- Okay. Um, and I traveled out of the country before that. So I for sure, I for sure bought <laughs> alcohol before I bought, before I bought uh, real estate. But I might have bought a stock before I bought alcohol. I think, okay. I think I bought my first stock before alcohol, to be fair. Um, I digress. Go back. <laughs> yeah. But my point is, I had this investor mindset. And people read my book. They're like, wait, 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 Chris, you're a multifamily investor. Well, if you read the book, what you'll see is I talk about the value as strategy. And I've often talked about multifamily real estate is buying businesses. We're, and you know this, Chad. We're buying a business that happens to have 100, 200, 300 renters. Those are our customers, right? That are paying our business every month. It's a business with monthly recurring revenue. And if we can improve the business, if we can improve the revenues of the business, if we can improve the operational efficiencies of the business and decrease the costs, we can increase the net operating income, right? In a business like a car wash, we increase the net operating income, the EBITDA, and it's the same thing. So if we look at real estate like a business, it's not a big stretch to go from buying an apartment building to buying a car wash. And we just have to understand that there are different levers, there are different knobs that we have to pull. We probably can't rely on the same employees or the same team to run those, but really it's the same thing. And the other thing is we have to think about kind of where we are in different business cycles. So there's, there's a few different reasons you know, that we are expanding, but really the philosophy has not changed. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I love the, yeah. the parallel you made there is, is we really are, you know, we, we, yes, we're talking about real estate. This is real estate runway. We're talking about income property, but everything that Chris said just then, you know, we have customers. Uh, this is talking about multifamily. We have customers. Those are renters. You know, mm -hmm. we have expenses. We have th th those customers come together as, as ideally 200 or more income streams that feed our top line. We have the ability to increase you know, that top line with, with, you know, at least biannual or annual lease trade out and things of that sort. And so it's no different, right? So yep. what are some of the common, you know, factors other than that? Or, and what are some of the strategies you've been able to kind of, well, let me back up even from that, Chris, yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sure. Why car washes? You could have chosen any business. Yeah. You could have gone and done software as a service. Like, why did you choose car washes? Yeah, good question. So I still love real estate and car washes have that component of real estate. And so I like businesses that have, that have really solid trends behind them, right? Long-term trends, yeah. demographic trends. I've come to learn about car washes over the last decade. Uh, my uncle and I almost bought, bought one. Oh, geez. It's probably been almost 10 years now. I forget the exact year, but it was before we even started looking at apartments. I've had coaching clients with car washes. I've seen kind of from the inside that these are very profitable businesses, okay? And then... Going and, and doing due diligence, going to different car wash shows and reading the research, specifically when it comes to express tunnel car washes, Chad, and I was in Nashville last year for the car wash show. And what, what they talked about, we have about 15 years before express tunnel car washes are fully built out before you reach um, capacity, essentially. So that's a good long-term trend. So why now? Well, private equity is looking for monthly recurring revenue businesses, okay? And so you want businesses that are, that are predictable, that have good demographic trends, that have high profit margins. Again, I like businesses that have a real estate component. We probably, if we're listening here, know about depreciation, right? Bonus depreciation is even better if you get that and car washes have that in spades. And then, you know, the other thing is you want, and I'll take a little, take a little pause here. When I was working in the OR, I had a surgeon I used to work with and we used to, we used to focus specifically on spine and spine implants. And one of the surgeons would say, well, how do I get 
you know, if, if it was a widget, they'd say, well, how do I, how do I get this out, Chris? So if I put this into a patient and there's a problem with it, how do I get it out? Right. I call that the exit strategy. That's your, that's your medical implant exit strategy. So who are you going to sell your apartments to, Chad? Right. We want to be in markets like you're in an awesome market in Houston, Texas, phenomenal state to be in. People want to own in, in Texas, right? People want to own in Houston. Private equity wants to own car washes now. So if we can package these businesses that are, we're buying from mom and pops, buying from small operators, where 85% of these are owned by small operators, it's the inverse of these apartments that we're buying, which are only about 15% are owned by small operators. We can package them together. And that's the messy part. That's making the sausage. And then ultimately, we can, we can sell them to a larger operator, like a private equity group or a larger uh, company that, that's running mm. these car washes. And you can sell it typically a 50 to 100% higher multiple than you bought at. Again, there's a lot of sausage making <laughs> that goes into that process because when you're buying from smaller operators, you have messy books, you might not have clean P&Ls, you might have employees that are maybe not ideal, you have nepotism, you have um, all kinds of stuff that you kind of have to clean up and do that. But if you can work through that and have an operating team that can take it and make that business successful on the other side, you know, there's definitely some profit to be had. Very interesting strategy, Chris. So if I, yeah. if I may go a little into the details, do you mind? Oh, yeah. Let's go for it. Okay. So, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, the value add strategies, like what mechanically you might go and do here. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm drawing parallels to, you know, renovating a kitchen or doing new flooring or just yeah. making the thing nicer that the residents are wanting to pay to live in, right? Yes. W what are some of the value add strategies that one might consider on a, on a car wash? What are you looking for yeah. when you go looking for these things? Yeah, great question. So I think you have to understand, like we have to understand uh, what are the drivers? Like why do we go to a car wash? Okay, so we want to feel good. We want to feel good about our car. And yeah. if you go to an express tunnel car wash, you know, cost is a factor. Time is a factor. Quality is a factor. All these things are a factor. But if I pull up to my local car wash, membership car wash, and there's a, a huge line, you know, I'm like, eh, maybe I'm not going to go today. I want to know that I can get in and out in a predictable amount of time. The quality is going to be consistent. It's not going to be the best wash I can get, but it's going to be consistent. And I'm going to feel good when I come out the other side, right? So how do you improve that experience? So one, you want to make sure you have, you have great equipment. You can, you have operators, like, I mean, like operators that are standing there moving, making sure the, the conveyor belt moves at the right speeds. Like, so people are in and out. You want to make sure that the equipment is in good working condition so they get a good quality car wash. Maybe you upgrade the blower because when you get out the other side and your car's wet, it's not going to give you quite the same experience and quality as if your car is dried. Vacuums, are the vacuums clogged? Do you have new vacuums? What about the microfiber towels? Do you have towels specifically for the wheels so you're not putting tire cleaner on your car when you dry off your car? You know, those sorts of things. You know, just little things that improve it. What about the lights, the LEDs inside? You know, if anybody has small kids that's listening, my kids love it. You, you pull the, uh, the shade off the sun or, sun or moon roof and you see like the, it looks like lava coming in. Like my boys love that. So, you know, you go to the grocery store, you go to Chick-fil-A, you go through the car wash, you go on the way home. That's a pretty good Saturday afternoon. You know, it's kind of like Will Ferrell in old school. But, you know, it's like, it's these little things because if my kids are having a good time, and they're in a good mood, I'm going to be in a good mood. And maybe not be like going to Olive Garden in old school, but it's, but it's a pretty good afternoon, right? So those are the things that we look for to improve the customer experience. And then what about increasing memberships? Like we improve sales, right? So, hey, how do we ask for a sale? Mr. Larson, we've seen you've been coming in here. Would you like 50% off or a free month membership? And then boom, you get the app and now you join the membership. And you can do upgrades through the app. You can do all kinds of different stuff, you know, with that. So, you know, improve that. And then, so you improve the customer experience, improve your revenue through monthly memberships. And then do you have the right chemical mixes or your spray angles correct? And that's when it really comes into real importance to figure out, like, are your operations efficient? So if you can lower those operational expenses while maintaining the quality and increasing the top line revenue, you have a recipe for success. Incredible and incredibly detailed, Chris. So I guess final question on the car wash side of things, you know, the, uh, you know, the, this, 
that's a discipline right there. I mean, this is almost akin to someone saying, hey, you know, I'm going to use your profession. I left medical device sales. I'm figuring out real estate. Now let me simultaneously go build out an entire team who knows how to, you know, perform construction, handle operations, all this kind of stuff. You didn't know all that when you started. You know, is, is this a factor of hiring the right team? I imagine there's not yeah, property 100%. management firms who can go do all this for you. So, you know, how do you build a team like that, you know? Yeah, 100%. And I have great partners. And that's the big thing is, you know, it's a lot harder to like go, I say like take an off the shelf operator for a car wash, right? And that was, that was the crux. I mentioned like there's, you got to make the sausage. And part of it is, you know, when you have people that are making say 15 bucks an hour that are your employees, you know, you have to, you have to have proper motivation. Maybe you have to pay a little bit more when it comes to that. Get that proper leaders in the team that understand the business. We brought in consultants and we helped build out the team. Uh, we have an engineer that run, that's the director of operations. So he understands machinery and he understands chemicals. And if you think about a car wash, if you go through one of these automatic car washes, yeah. which is basically a giant robot with chemicals and water in it, that's what we're dealing with. So having somebody, having the right people in the right place is, is super important when it comes to that. And going from an individual contributor as a salesperson in my career to a leader and looking at teams, you know, a lot, you have to look in the mirror a lot of times and say, hey, I, I just can't do this all myself. I'm not the best at everything. And you have, to, you have to learn to step back, put the right people in the right place and give them the runway so that, that they can go and, and be See successful. what you did there. Nice. You know, Chris, the engineer in me wants to just go down this path all day, but I have to abide by my podcast yeah. rule that the mind can only endure what the butt can endure. So listeners, we're going to get right into the quattro questions. Yes, there are four of them. Yes, it's a play on words. And uh, are you ready, Chris? I am ready. All right. So first question, what is your superpower in life or business and how does it serve you well? Yeah. So this, this comes from my wife. So she said one day, she's like, she's like, the, the worst things get Chris, the calmer you seem to be. And I think that was kind of a backhanded compliment because she's like, you got a lot of energy and sometimes, you know, you get all, you got all excited about stuff. But when the, when that, you know, what hits the fan, she's like, you're, you're the calm one in the room. And I think that really helped specifically when I was in the OR, right? Yeah. I think it came before that, but it's nice when somebody, you know, when things are going crazy, you know, I, I, I feel like I could always kind of see through that and see what the solutions were. And it really kind of helped, helped kind of sharpen my mind. So yeah, when, when things are tough, I feel like I can take a deep breath and focus. You know, I would say that's probably the true definition of a superpower is having the ability to do that, Chris. So that is, that's fantastic. We'll call them super large. I wouldn't mind flying though, dude. Like that. Yeah, good. flying would be pretty good too, you know. But <laughs> all right, second question. So we've heard a lot of cool things today, Chris, but give me some dirt, man. What's your biggest failure in life or business? Your choice. And what'd you learn from it? Biggest, biggest failure. I had a really bad failure when it came to, to one of my first partnerships. And I've actually had I've had a few partnerships fail in life. And I, I think it's it's hard to say, like, you know, I look back at those and a lot of good came from those failures because I learned a lot and that led to better, bigger, uh, more important partnerships. But during that whole process, there were some friends that were lost. So I think, you know, without, without kind of naming names and going into specifics, you know, I think whether it's maybe through, I'm trying to think like what, what the exact, like how to describe the exact cause of that, but not being able to see those potential failures coming you know, whether that, whether that was through hubris or lack of knowledge or whatever it may be, it's really challenging. And if, if there weren't friends involved, if there you know, weren't relationships that were lost, because that's really what it all comes down to is relationships. But whenever a relationship is lost, that's a huge failure in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about people. That's what we're doing this for. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's the old adage that partnerships are like marriages, except a little harder to get out of. So sometimes uh, those can be <laughs> a little messy, but Confucius said, still married, still married, been with my yes. wife for 20, going on 22 years. So, well, that says a lot. He's exited partnerships, but not his marriage. So it must be a pretty good one. <laughs> you know, the, uh, and, and Confucius say, I mean, he who cannot look around corner to see bus coming will get smashed by bus. So you have to, uh, you have to learn how to maybe Confucius That's didn't right. say that, but you get my point. Uh, anyway, so, okay, let's get on to the next question, Chris. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So at, here at Quattro, we have four pillars, people, property, profit, and philanthropy. 
philanthropy is the caring for people. So it comes right back around to the yeah. first one that is people. You know, yeah. what philanthropic ventures, you know, is your heart pretty close to? Yeah. What motivates you in that world? And a lot of times we found that when we share this information, our listeners actually will go and give on your behalf or alongside you. So love to hear where your heart is there, man. Yeah. So I think, you know, sometimes we say, oh, I want to go do this. I want to, I want to donate to this or go do this cause. I think, you know, I have a passion for, for finance and financial literacy. So I've really embraced that. So we started a financial literacy program for a nonprofit here called Open Doors of Asheville, uh, which yeah. is neat because it started for uh, middle and high school kids. And you have parents in the back of the room that were coming to learn. I wrote a chapter for a children's book and you can get that, basically that chapter on our website at nextlevelincome.com forward slash kids. If you want to learn five steps to teach your children how to be money pros. We also kind of revolving around the children. I coach uh, my son's cycling team. So I always try to look and say, hey, how can we have the biggest impact going forward? I think, you know, financially we can make a humongous impact in this country, but really it all comes down to in my opinion, you know, how can we impact our next generation and, and the children? That's going to make the biggest impact in my mind. That's incredible. And really, it's, it's planting seeds for the future. And unfortunately, our educational system will never get there on this. We hope one day, but uh, it's just not there. So Yeah, but look, everybody that's listening has the power to, to make a difference, right? And we can point fingers and say that my mom was a teacher, my grandmother was a teacher. I got a lot from the education system, but it's definitely not perfect. So we can all go and and try to make a difference on our own, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, good deal. And uh, before we go, you have not only a book, but a podcast, you know, and and ways people can actually reach out and work with you. So do me a favor, share those real quick. Just love to make sure people can get in touch with you and find the awesome value creators you have out there. Yeah. So again, subscribe for free, nextlevelincome.com. You can click on the podcast link. Uh, check out our podcast. Got some great guests that come on there. For your listeners today, Chad, if you want a free copy of the book sent to your house and you're here in North America, click on the book link at nextlevelincome.com and I'll send you a free copy. You can also download the ebook and audio version. And this is new. I didn't share this uh, when we were booking the podcast, Chad, but we also have a new course available. And oh. if you're interested in checking out the course, I'm going to have to send you a link, Chad, but you can use the uh, discount code CHAD, C-H-A-D. I'd say Quattro, but we might misspell Quattro, so we'll just say Chad. <laughs> and um, yeah, your listeners will get a 30% discount. And then I'll talk about how to make more money, keep more money, specifically tax strategies, insurance strategies, estate planning strategies. And then also we have a really cool spreadsheet in there, which you could put your deals that you've invested with Chad in and see what you're going to achieve financial independence. And I'll send you that uh, info here, Chad, if you'd like to share that with your audience as well. Absolutely. So folks, as usual, whatever modality you're listening to this in, scroll right on down to the show notes and all this wonderful value will be right there, clickable at your leisure. So Chris, man, thank you for coming on the show. Incredible conversation. Love to do it again sometime for sure. And uh, yeah, hope you, I mean, you were just getting off to a massive start in 2023. So I hope 2023 is awesome for you and your company. And uh, we're going to see Chris Larson not be the Bitcoin billionaire, but the car wash billionaire before a few years or so. <laughs> Thanks for trying to on, catch. Man. I'll try to catch, try to catch the other Chris Larson, right? Thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. Fantastic. All right, everyone. This has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. Until next time, over and out. All right, everyone. That was some cool stuff. Chris is a stud. Thank you all for listening to the podcast there about, you know, cash flow and car washes and how real estate is a business and just some of our other, you know, financial independence rants we went on. I love when we do that. Just go off script a little bit. But if you got any value out of the show, as a reminder, please scroll down, give us that five-star review at least, or at least a thoughtful comment. We love those. We read every single one of them, and it really helps us grow the show. Until next time, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast, over and out. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.